this is Will and this is my first episode of a new project interviewing great teachers who taught in the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s but are nearing retirement or who have just retired now uh, and I'm trying to recover what the educational culture was like uh, back in the recent past in an age which has made so much progress in many ways but which just sometimes feels a little bit less free, a little bit less spontaneous, arguably a little bit less magical uh, than the descriptions often given of teaching uh, just a few decades ago. This first episode is with a very old friend, uh, Ridian Llewellyn. Rid was a housemaster at the Dragon School in Oxford and then was headmaster of Papplewick School in Ascot. And in this uh, hour or so's chat, we talk about um, the world of the prep boarding school, uh, which is particularly from the ages of eight to 13. Uh, he talks with a, a bit of a slant towards all boys schools, but he's, he taught in both uh, single sex and co-educational schools. Um, and we talk mainly through the prism of his own, his own career, um, but uh, we also talk um, about his reflections on uh, the school culture generally. He talks about his concerns about sort of increasing conformity, um, what pressure's like on staff today compared to what it was like when he first started. Uh, he talks a little bit about his lessons that he taught in history and English, the advice he tends to give uh, to young teachers and the best advice that he received. I really hope you enjoy it uh, and look forward to hearing what you think. Thanks. Bye. Well, Rid, thank you very much for being my guinea pig for this project. Not at all. You've devoted your whole life, as far as I can work out, to teaching in boarding prep schools. Um, did you have that education yourself? I did. Um, I was uh, an August birthday. Always young, so just after my seventh birthday, my father shook me by the hand and off I went to uh, a prep school in Somerset, Hillbrow, which closed down. Um, d d d most of the schools I've been associated with actually closed down. down. Yes, Heather <laughs> down as well. That's why I went to Heather down in, uh, in 1966 as a, um, a nine year old, um, and uh, because Hillbrow closed down. Um, and Heather Down, and after that uh, to, to Bangor. So I've been in boarding schools, yes, all my life, I suppose. I have tried to escape occasionally. <laughs> it's not quite true to say I spent all my time uh, there. I mean, I obviously, in the last 13 years, in which, you know, after, after retiring as headmaster of Papplewick, um, I've obviously been strongly connected with education, running a business connected with um, our great schools has been a wonderful phase, probably the happiest, actually, I would say, probably the happiest phase of my life. So, and so I, I, yeah. I don't think I've actually answered your question. <laughs> what was your question? Remind me of the... You, you, well, the question you, was whether you'd been in that education yourself, yes, yes, which you had. Yeah. And before we go on to how you got into teaching, mm. Um, mm. it's an increasingly unusual education, boarding before the mm. age of 13. Mm. Uh, why do you think it's sort of ceased to be um, part of the sort of mainstream of, of educational choice amongst parents? It's interesting. I became a headmaster during the early 90s, during the, you know, the, the, that recession. And at the time, I thought that um, uh, it was a, a difficult time for the boarding schools. Um, Esther Ranson had her stilettos to our throats. Um, and it was difficult to tell at the time whether this was a, a fundamental sociological shift that English parents were no longer sending their sons and daughters away at eight. Um, or at the time, I rather believed that they were dressing it up as such, whereas really it was becoming terribly expensive. Mm. Um, I now think there was a there, there is a fundamental. I mean, how many eight year old boarders you know? Well, more than me. How many eight year old boarders are there left, and how many of them are English? Mm, mm. Uh, so, uh, I think there has been a, a fundamental sociological shift, 
based on mothers, uh, I think, being uh, t- not necessarily making the decisions, but, but having a greater influence over decision making. Mm. Um, whereas I think that in the past, you know, father sent son off to where he had been, if it was still open, and uh, those who had been teaching him weren't all in prison. <laughs> Um, so um, uh, I, I, I think there is a shift now, and, and I can see it continuing. Sadly, I, I, and I do think this is. I mean, I, I can, I can see, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of those who believe that sending an eight-year-old off to boarding school, you know, makes them a social pariah. I, I can see eight becoming eleven actually. Mm. So, w- what are the chief merits of boarding under thirteen that are that are most missed by its critics do you think or, or but if you had the the ear of uh... i i still think and i wish that there was a more consistent message coming out of the boarding schools at 13 the senior schools to say boarding for a couple of years um at, at prep school where you, you already have your mates hmm. um it will be a great advantage I don't think it's actually very kind to send children away at 13 when they are um, perhaps going to a school where they know no one, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're going through experiencing changes themselves, they're learning to rub shoulders with fellow pupils who are grown men and women to them, <laughs> to a 13 year old. I think it's. I think there's much, a much stronger argument should be um, expressed. Not not for eight year old boarding. Mm. I mean, that's had its day. Uh, that's had its day. Yep. But for boarding for a couple of years uh, as a big boy in a little school where you're, you've already got your mates, rather than boarding for the first time at thirteen. I notice you say boy rather than girl. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm harking back, of course, to my experience at Papawick. Mm. Uh, we, we, we were a boys' school. Uh, of course, the Dragon beforehand was, was a co-ed school, but in my time, rather an odd co-ed school. Uh, I, I think it was a real sense in which the girls were honorary boys, <laughs> um, and, um, and they um, were restricted at one time to daughters of old dragons and sisters of dragons. Oh, really? So, and then before falling foul of equal opportunities <laughs> legislation. So now I, I'm I'm not wholly unreconstructed. I, I do I do uh, I, I, I it's it's just obviously the experience of Papwick, which was boys only. So, Red, tell me the story of your entrance into teaching. Um, totally by mistake. Uh, I'd love to be able to tell you, Will, that it was my vocation. I mean, it is in the family. My grandmother taught. My sister taught. My father always said that he would love to have been a schoolmaster. But then he was a politician, so I imagine there were a lot of professions that <laughs> he said he'd like to be. Um, so, um, no, I, I, I left school in 1975. Um, I wanted a gap year. No, they weren't so in those days and I said this to my father and I thought he might explode but actually he handled it brilliantly in retrospect he said um, well that's absolutely fine you can you, you can delay university for a year that's absolutely fine uh, but what are you going to do <laughs> and then I thought oh uh, and he said uh, because don't think I'm going to support you and actually that's the best thing that almost he ever did um, so I'd kept in touch with somebody lived close to us in Yattenden, who, who taught science at um, my prep school at Heatherdown. Mm. And um, I, got, I got a job there. So I mean, then one was really flung into the deep end. I mean, as an 18-year-old, you weren't a stooge, so a gappy. Or <laughs> you, you were a, you know, I taught common entrance uh, English. Uh, so you were really thrown in at the deep end. The, the turning the, point the came book. with Arnold House, yes. Right. That it, when I, my father bombarded me so keenly, you see, <laughs> that um, I had a flat at the top of Primrose Hill and he bombarded me with advertisements. And one, <laughs> I thought, caught my eye, not because it was a very suitable job for me, because the, it, was, it, it, was, uh, it was from Arnold House, which was very close in St John's Wood. And... It, and, um, uh, and uh, the advertisement... 
um, was asking for a teacher of Latin and French. Well, I had O-level <laughs> Latin and A-level French. You read English at university? I read history, history at, right, yeah, yeah. at uh, UCL. UCL yeah. And um, so it wasn't a very suitable job. But what, what I really discovered is he wanted someone to take the, to take the cricket. <laughs> and so the real, the, he asked me no questions. This was a great Johnny Clegg, one of the great headmasters. And it was, it was as a result of Johnny saying to me one night, uh, you've got to be a practical school headmaster and this is what you must do. You must you know, go off to so the So you knew him before? No, no, I didn't. Okay, I, right. I've met him for the first time. Um, I, I remember wearing my MCC tie. And the, the Strategically. Been, the, there'd been an altercation. <laughs> I, not that I knew really what he was after, but that uh, he was the most terrific footballer. He was a fantastic footballer. And I had to take the football as well, which I was... Well, I can't come to that in a minute, but... Um, um, he, he uh, there'd been an altercation in the pavilion, and a member had grabbed the umpire, David Constant, and sort of shaken him up because play hadn't started, and the, obviously the member thought it should have done. And there was a big row about it at the time. So the first question he asked me was, "Was it you who <laughs> grabbed the umpire?" <laughs> and uh, he was very ostensibly quite frightening, quite. Uh, but he was a real softy, brilliant prep school headmaster. The boys. Again, boys in school absolutely adored him. And uh, he wanted me to take, I didn't get one question on Latin or French, which is just as well. Um, and when it came to going out to the back to the playground, there were strategically placed a set of stumps uh, and a bat and a ball. And he said, uh, well, you bet. And now the... This was after your interview. This was, this was the interview. <laughs> this was the interview itself. <laughs> And he could see that I could play, and that all was well. I had to not necessarily thought, teach cricket, uh, but play cricket. I mean, he wanted no, what yeah. he wanted me to run the first eleven. Right, that's what he was really looking. For, someone to run the first eleven cricket and the first eleven football. He was a very keen games player, Vincent's club, you know. But, but he didn't yeah. say Te teach me about the LBW rule. He says no, no, take up your bat. He, yes, he wanted <laughs> to know whether. Yes, exactly. Um, and he also football. I the most tremendous float par. I made because he said, uh, um, and uh, what about football? And I said, well, I watched match of the day. Because <laughs> I'd never been a great shiny shorts man. Um, been going to a rugby school and so forth. So, um, uh, um, and I later no, transpired enough. that he'd been a trialist for Man U and had been offered terms by Wolves. And he was legendary at Shrewsbury School. He ran up the, the wing with his plimsolls, you know, and he was a legendary figure. But he wow. was... He was a great, you know, we, everyone needs a mentor, and mine was Johnny Clegg, and uh, I owe him everything, and that is why I became a schoolmaster. Yeah. I learned how to be a schoolmaster under Johnny Clegg. And I want to, want to talk more about sort of training and development and mm. that sort of thing, but mm. most teachers listening to this or re reading this would say the that interview process <laughs> reeks of the sort of worst amateurishness, unprofessionalism, yeah, the, the idea that not even you didn't have the PTC or Q, QTS, no. but you, you didn't even have a degree or an A-level in the subjects that he wanted you to teach. Uh, an A-level in French. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, how, how would he have defended himself against the charge of uh, of, of unprofessionalism in that respect? Um, it, that's a very good question, um, and I'm sure that as time developed, we're going back now to 1979, 1980, yeah. um, and, and I'm sure that um, others were interviewed more professionally than I was. <laughs> I think it was also, as far as I remember in his defence, it was quite a last minute thing. Mm. So, had a and so you know, yeah. it was during the holidays, certainly. And when we went into the kitchens, there was an outbreak of cockroaches. And like, <laughs> you know, but it was a great school. Yeah. And um, I think that he would have defended himself on the grounds that I need somebody, um, you know, half decent, with half decent qualifications, perhaps not in the right subject, um, who understood the system. Hmm. Um, and I would say that he would use his instinct and, and he perhaps mm. he thought in me there was something of a, a kindred spirit yeah. somebody who was young and possibly a bit wild but um, <laughs> uh, malleable um, and would be would be popular with the boys and I mm. think that mattered mm. uh, to him 
Um, so, yes, I'm yeah. sure as time developed, uh, senior staff would have been much more involved in the process. And gosh, when I was at Papawick, um, the hoops they had to go through, the interviews with senior management team, I mean, mm. so much so that the director of music, the last director of music I pointed at Bert Papawick said, um, I was sitting down having a whiskey with him in the evening. He said he'd come down from Aberdeen or Inverness or somewhere. <laughs> and uh, he was sitting down in my house at Papawick and he said, oh. I said, how have you, what have you thought of our process today? He said, I thought I was being interviewed for director of music, <laughs> not Pope. <laughs> so I know that's something that has yeah. changed and changed vastly yeah. for the better. Uh, but I would defend Johnny um, to the hilt because um, I own everything. All for the better? I mean, do you think anything's been lost in the way teachers are recruited by schools these days? Um, I think there has been a drive towards conformity. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's essentially a good thing mm. that, uh, uh, that staff applications now, they have to fill in a form, it makes it easier to <laughs> compare. And, but the danger of that is it can become rather a tick boxing mm. exercise. Uh, I think there's always room, as long as you remember, that there's always room for a bit of instinct, a bit of Johnny Clegg, <laughs> um, uh, um, and, and also for different characters. I think there has been a terrific drive in, in education towards conformity um, in every aspect. You know, it's been inspection-led, it's been legislation-led, health and safety-led. And I think there has been, if there's been a trend that actually I warned about in the early, as early as the early 90s, it has been away from trust yeah. towards excessive accountability. Now, I recognise absolutely that my parents were much too trusting of the people who were supposed to be looking <laughs> after us. Um, uh, but, but now I think there is an excessive accountability mm. so that a lot of that sort of old, I, I would say dragon spontaneity because that was a very, mm. you know, um, by word. cold, yeah. in this bitterly cold weather, let's, you know, let's um, uh, make an ice rink and abandon lessons for the morning. You yeah. know, it, 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 you know, they wouldn't have done a, a, a risk assessment. In fact, in fact, being at the dragon school was one long risk. <laughs> Uh, but but I don't think the children suffered as a result of that. Mm. I think they probably they uh, a had a more complete education as a result. They used of to play in the river and the child well, didn't they? They or, did. Yeah. They did. And and of course the greasy pole, which was such fun. What was that? The rag regattas, greasy pole, a place to cross the charwell, and um, uh, boys in there, you know, swimmers obviously because they all fell in, uh, <laughs> had pillows with balloons or something. I mean, not, 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 they didn't have those. Barbaric. <laughs> and, the, and they sort of, you know, had a fight in the, in the, and, and they all ended up in the, in the you know, in the, <laughs> with, with and, and the pole was greased, obviously, because it was <laughs> so to make it difficult to stay on. I mean, all that sort of thing. Um, I mean, the child was one, one huge health hazard, I would have thought, but... Um, <laughs> no, I, were there teachers around making sure that was... Oh, right? yes, yeah. they'd be around... Yeah. They'd be around, yes, yes, yeah. uh, to make sure no one drowned, yes, mm. yeah. And how do you ever get back to a culture like that? Because it seems sort of mm. unidirectional, really, that once you have the forms and the accountability measurements and, and, and whatnot, it's very hard to then jettison them. Um, but. Have you seen any schools in your work in the last 13 years that have sort of stood up to that? that I, I that think there have been schools, uh, don't ask me to name no. them, but who, who, whose instinct it is to uh, try and ensure that the best of the old is retained in that mm. sense. It's not easy, um, and I'm not suggesting one should go back to exactly to how things how things were but I think there are I think uh, I think there are some who try hard mm. and they should be applauded yeah. have parents changed a lot in yes. this respect yeah. hugely absolutely hugely um, I know I'm not comparing exactly like with like but as senior housemaster at the dragon school looking after 80 11 to 13 year olds um, the parents were our friends mm. 
I cannot remember um, a, a difficult, uh, a, any difficulty, and of course mm. one had to tell parents that their boys had been smoking or naughty in some mm. respect, or whatever it was, and how we were punished. And, and interesting, I was having dinner with two former schoolhouse parents in Oxford the other day, who said that they wouldn't have dared challenge what I said, <laughs> which struck me as being extraordinary. Uh, because I was never, I don't think, a sort of a, a stern disciplinarian. Um, and um, uh, I think the parents have changed hugely. And then mm. as the 90s progressed, uh, obviously being a headmaster, the buck stops with you. And I'm sure that, you know, we used to hear from time to time that the headmaster of the Dragon School, Keith Ingram, had his moments with... Michael Heseltine, I seem to remember, <laughs> um, and and of course he he protect, he shield, he must have shielded. He was such yeah. a good man. He must have shielded a lot of the uh, of, the, of that stuff from us. But but a Papplewick increasingly. I mean, they, it's very easy to exaggerate this because I would say that you know ninety seven percent of the parents of Papplewick were hugely supportive, understood what we were trying to do, um, but you know three percent mm. take up ninety seven percent of your time. And I think it's got. I think it's got now worse. That number will have I think it. I, no, I, yeah. I think it's got worse. It's what I never wrote an email as a headmaster. Um, and you know they tell me now they get even in small schools. Um, yeah. um, 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 I was at Horace Hill the other day, one hundred and twenty odd, um, and you know the headmaster Giles there will get sort of eighty to hundred emails a day. Gosh. How can you be a schoolmaster? And, uh, and, and interesting, at the governor's meeting at um, St. Philip's last night, it was quite interesting, the discussion about whether staff emails should be given to the parents. Now, mm. of course, generally, heads are very keen that they should, <laughs> because it, it means that not everything lands on the prep school headmaster's desk, but they can ask, uh, if they so wish, and I think they do, <laughs> to, uh, to address their question to the person who's most likely to be able to deal with it quickly mm. and I, I obviously it's terribly important that emails are answered quickly even if they're just holding ones mm. but it, it does not make life uh, difficult mm. I know parents have certainly um, uh, got worse <laughs> 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 to go back to that sort of image of the boys playing or the boys and girls playing on the on the greasy pole yeah yeah g give me more of a sense of the mood and spirit of 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 the Dragon and Papawick back in the 80s and uh, 90s? I think a lot of laughter. Um, teachers I, I, and, and uh, pupils. Teachers and pupils. Um, I've only come across one rather complicated boy, actually, who, who positively disliked his time at the Dragon. Mm. Well, when someone like Roger Scruton says children shouldn't enjoy their school days, <laughs> they should benefit from them. <laughs> <laughs> I about? don't agree with that, actually. I agree with a lot of what Roger Scruton <laughs> says, but I don't agree with that. I think that, um, I mean, my first great influence was Johnny Clegg, mm. who, who, who said the one thing that mattered above all was that was children's self-esteem. Now, you might, you know, I think Prince Charles, among others, has warned that really this has gone a bit too far, <laughs> uh, and you can certainly argue that. I think that if boy or girl is happy at school, mm. they're more likely to do well. Mm. And um, I would say that confidence was the key word, really. And I, and I strongly believe in doing everything. Strongly believe in that, that, that you know, if you score the winning try on <laughs> Saturday, you're more likely to do well in your exams on Monday. Mm. You know, I, I, I think the schools, there, there are some wonderful schools, really. And I think they do a fantastic job. So if you were walking through say the dragon in the 80s yes. compared to walking through a, a, a typical prep school now what would be the the key well i think probably to... dragons are a bit smarter now than they were <laughs> they were notoriously scruffy um the and children. that was considered quite a <laughs> yes yeah, quite a positive thing yeah um as were the staff i mean it wasn't you know there wasn't sort of compulsory jackets and ties well no, i think that's fair enough if, if you don't ask the, the, the boys to wear much of a uniform mm. Um, I go to the Dragon today and I see a, a much more ordered place. I think a happy place still, mm. I'm sure. A much more ordered place, much smarter. I've become more like Summerfields in that <laughs> respect too. 
Uh, that's scruffy old rink and all sorts of things that the boys absolutely loved, uh, and girls. Um, you know, I'm sure they are happy. I think it's more ordered. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was just some of the things that cannot take place today. I mean, you couldn't risk, I don't think, uh, the, the greasy pole, mm. the, the rag regattas, the um, leavers picnic, you know, the we used to punt uh, the boys up to the Vicky Arms. Um, Which is a pub. Yeah, the, the, the pub. Okay. Uh, and, you know, run up a slate. I mean, there was a huge drinking culture. And I think that has changed yeah. a lot. There wouldn't be such a drinking culture. The, I mean, the, the bar was open. Uh, the bar was open for staff at lunchtime. And I remember wow. going to see, even me, I mean, I'm no <laughs> great um, Puritan. Uh, going, going to see Keith and saying, I think we really should. This is 1989. I really think we should, we should close the bar. And um, uh, he said, I always remember his reply. He said, yes, I've thought about that. But if we close the bar, then people like Dougie Duff, oh, my poor old Dougie Duff was singled out, would go off to the Rosen Crown, and I'd much prefer him on the premises. So, you know, that was... And I think it was that sort of humour. And the... And, and the... You know, and I have a little story about Ingram. Coming back with um, a cup that we had won in a jet cricket tournament. And I suddenly thought, I can't come back, you know, we used to come back and claim our gin. Now that doesn't go on anymore, and I mean, you know, there's sort of, and I've been to a lot of prep schools, and you know, after cricket, we always used to, the staff used to have a drink with the headmaster, mm. and it was it was very civilized and and, and um, something to look forward to, and um, coming back from Yarlett Hall I remember, in Staffordshire <laughs> with this cup, and uh, you know, presenting it very proudly to Keith, and uh, I said, Keith. Never see, you know, you go into Caldecott and you see us almost vulgar array of uh, <laughs> silverware. And I said, where do we... We Is must it? win things. <laughs> We're rather a large school. <laughs> um, where do we keep this sort of stuff? And he said, um, oh, under my bed. <laughs> and that seemed yeah. very dragon. That was... Um, so I suppose schools show off a bit more now mm. than they <clears> used to. Um, and... Um, but they're still, I mean, gosh, I go to a lot of prep schools and, and give away prizes and things like that. And goodness me, yeah. I'm impressed with the product, I yeah. have to say. Yeah. I wonder whether that drinking culture is sociological and cultural as well. I mean, I think it is. People in their 20s and 30s drink, I can't remember the exact statistics, but much less than no. <laughs> people in their 40s and 50s and 60s. I mean, our boys yeah. are so responsible about <laughs> drinking and driving, yeah. for example. Yeah. Um, and the city culture back which in those we were, days we were less much, responsible it, well, I it wasn't quite a yes <clears> exactly <throat> um, I think you know God I mean you can have fun without drinking but I, I just worry sometimes and talking to there are still one or two who taught who, teaching at the Dragon today who, who, who taught with me in the 80s um, and they tell me it's it's really quite pressurised now and I mm. never felt Mm. Um, and um, and it's not so much fun, and that seems to be a shame because, you know, if the staff are seen with smiles on their faces, they, they, yeah. they're the role models for these boys, and um, uh, and that seems to be a shame if they if they are stressed and communicate that anxiety, yeah. and certainly on some governing bodies, I sit on now, it's quite a regular feature. Um, star morale. stress, yeah. star yeah. morale, star yeah. stress. Um, it's 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 and that that is a worry, definitely. Yeah, let's let's talk a bit more about that because you know the, <clears throat> the reality of being a teacher now is is quite regular observations from your peers yes. or your heads. Yes. Um, oh. a, a a plan of continual professional development. Yes. A lot of reflecting on one's practice, that sort of thing. Mm. What, what was your own training regime like, Red? Um, m well, when I started teaching at a uh, at um, at Heatherdown, well, there, there were no heads of department. You see, it was a small, it was a 
a school for 80 boys. Um, and there were, there were no heads of department. I don't remember anybody telling me what I should teach, <laughs> which seemed quite extraordinary because I was only five years older than the oldest boy. This is when you had some quite illustrious pupils. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. We were horrified. You know. <laughs> yes. It, it was. We had um, uh, Prince Edward um, and his cousin James uh, Ogilvy. Um, in fact, I would say that you know the majority of the parents were were titled <laughs> uh, David Cameron, of course, who, who became a lifelong friend. Mm. Um, uh, and no one sat you down and said, this is your syllabus for this year? No. No. I <laughs> asked to see, or perhaps I was shown, uh, when I, uh, a few common entrance English papers. Mm. And so, so I'm afraid it was pretty dull fare. Um, that, you know, that we, we practised comprehension. or Using your own books that you'd chosen yourself? Um, well, they were probably yeah. from past papers, actually. Yes, and I don't what else we do? Oh, and then they would do a composition. Um, grammar was taught in those days largely through Latin, mm. but there'd be the odd spelling test, you know, I, I just sort of... And you'd write your lesson plan such that it was five, <laughs> five minutes before starting? or I, mean, I don't you... think I would write yeah. it down, actually, Well, I taught a bit of Latin. Yeah. Um, and you know the important thing there was it was you know pretty pretty much um, uh, Richie's I don't know first steps in Latin yeah. which the boys always changed Latin to eating <laughs> and um, uh, and one stayed a page ahead of uh, of them <laughs> and if we covered what I vaguely I think so, I do remember the chap who taught the senior Latin saying get to page X by the end of term <laughs> and there should be plenty of time to do that and if they're good. Read them from the read them a bit of the Greek mythology or something on a, on a Friday if they're mm. good, which is a good thing to do in the afternoons anyway. If they're a bit fractious and not taking much in on a Friday <laughs> afternoon, or, um, and then I remember teaching a bit of maths to form two or form one. I can't remember what so it's these called. These eight the, or nine year olds. The, yes, yeah. the real babies, and and um, uh, and the headmaster saying to me at break. Um, this is now. This was my first experience of an inspector. What an inspector and who the inspector was, I don't know. And why he was there on a Saturday afternoon. There must have been, I don't know, racing at Ascot in the <laughs> afternoon <Nearby>. or something. <laughs> um, and, it, and a break, the headmaster, James Edwards, said to me, what are you doing with Form 2? Uh, uh, and I said, oh, uh, Saturday morning I do their tables. And um, he said, no, 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 don't do that. He said, don't do that. He said, do something trendy. So anyway, I had them. Actually, this was seventy nine. Was it? Uh, this would have been earlier. No, seventy five, seventy six. So seventy six, probably. The idea of being 76. creative in one's teaching it even was was in the I air. I think then. it was yeah. in the air as far as in, obviously as far as that he heard about this this inspector <laughs> was concerned. Well, any anybody was trendy compared with the things that were being done at uh, Heatherdown. I mean, we had I put out the signs for the loos on Sports Day, and there were three. Ladies, gentlemen, and chauffeurs. <laughs> um, so that gives you an idea of the sort of place it was. So I had them all, and this masses, and I had them all on the floor measuring, and it was actually fantastic. I mean, and then writing down a bit of graph paper. And I, it was God, and, this is group and uh, group based project based trendy. learning. It was very trendy. It really was. And um, uh, and then uh, uh, headmaster came in, beamed, and said, well, "What's going on here?" And I said, "Well, we're measuring the classroom today." So it's marvellous, said the inspector. And then, of course, the boys have a habit of letting you down. And one put up his hand and said, Sir, this is great fun. Can we do it more often? <laughs> um, so that was my first encounter with an inspector. But I think it shows how um, I don't remember ever being inspected at Arnold House in the early 80s. I don't remember... I remember the first computers coming in, but they didn't really work. Uh, confront. It certainly <laughs> didn't work, uh, and it, so they didn't really. I, I, I didn't come across them much. I don't remember any peer observation, um, and yet, but the dragon. 
Well, that was interesting. I mean, I think that there was something about the dragon um, that was actually, I would say, quite progressive, depending. It wasn't a sort of whole school thing. It depended on that, to a huge degree, on the heads of department. Right. And I, well, Keith Ingram appointed me in 1986. I probably got the letter in sometime in 85. And he said, he wrote me a letter and said, this will be your starting salary. At some stage, you better come along and see Desmond Devitt and Michael Harrison, because you'll be teaching in the English and uh, history and English departments. And I duly went along and I thought, Every question they asked was prefaced with, the, well, if you get the job. And I said, well, what sort of place is this? <laughs> I've already got the job. But I obviously I didn't say anything. And in fact, Desmond and Michael became very, very good friends. But they ran, I would say, superb departments. Right. And, and actually, Desmond was, was very progressive and more progressive than some members of his department. Um, that, you know, he, he, he was very keen on skills. Not just content, <laughs> but skills, and we had a um, we we had a, a meeting every Monday morning. Uh, there was coffee and cake, uh, and um, you know, essentially, tell us what to teach. Uh, and this is the first time I'd ever encountered not <laughs> a plan. Wing, yeah. Well, I say winging, not doing what I thought was be fun for the boys and get them through their exam, girls, mm. and get them through their exams. Um, the only exams you you sort of had was this exam common entrance which is on the horizon yes. at 13 so yeah. with the 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds there was very little stress really cause it, very little stress I, there would have been end of term exams yeah. which um, but, but they were a very routine thing and, and, and therefore came as no sort of it was just part and parcel of their academic diet mm. um, so there was a sort of peer peer support of a sense of department all pulling in the same direction at least at the dragon and the, yeah, kind, of, kind of that was how training one improved. very strong yeah. very strong yeah. i mean michael harrison told us all i mean you can imagine huge numbers teaching english at the dragon mm. um some better qualified than others uh to do so and he would say we all had to the first five minutes of every english lesson was taken up with handwriting practice. Yeah. You know, it was really yeah. quite prescriptive. Yeah. And um, do you feel you got better as a teacher over your time before you became a head? Um, th through anything you were, I suppose, um, taught rather than just learnt through experience? Mostly it was learnt through experience. Mm. I mean, I, I think at uh, the Dragon, there were no rules as such. And therefore, it was terribly important to to dominate your classroom, to 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 be to 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 exercise control of personality. So, what, um, what, so that yeah. that was very true there. But I certainly learned. I certainly learned from people like Desmond uh, and and Michael. I mean, I, I whilst not buying totally that you know <laughs> if they have a lot of skills. Uh, and can interpret or spot bias in uh, some <laughs> evidence. <laughs> I'd still like them to know some facts. Yeah. Um, but I, but you know, I learned a lot. And I, I would say that um, uh, I've never been on a. Uh, I've never had any teaching practice, or uh, I didn't do a PGC. I did a dip ed in Oxford, and that there were two papers I had. So I did it in a year. I think it's supposed to last two years. I did two papers, one in the history of education, which of course was very interesting, mm. I mean, I, and, and uh, that was very easy. Helpful for, for your uh, craft as a teacher? No, not at all. <laughs> not absolutely not at all. Uh, and the other was the organisation and administration of education in the United Kingdom. And I used to be able to tell you how the rate support grant, whatever it's called, <laughs> worked and how uh, money allocated for... Uh, education in cabinet ended up on provision of traffic lights. <laughs> Nothing to do with the classroom whatsoever. <laughs> um, I did go on a course which helped me greatly actually. One course in my life uh, uh, which Desmond Devitt sent me on 
um, a, a time management course. Right. And particularly at the Dragon, when you were doing, particularly when I became a housemaster, editor of the Draconian, I had my cricket side, you know, and it was very, it was, I never stopped very to full. analyse yeah. how much time I do it on the appraisal forms regularly. Um, how much time do you allocate to various parts of your job description and so forth, responsibilities? And I, I never stopped to think. And actually, I was quite horrified when I actually stopped to think, how much time do I spend on these various things? And uh, I suppose, like us all, we, we spend most time on the things we really enjoy. And I was spending... I was devoting far more time to the Draconian, which was a school magazine which came out termly, so it was quite, it was quite mm. something, uh, uh, than I was running a house of 80 boys. Mm. So that, that was the, the most, and I think probably the only, um, certainly the most beneficial, and I think the only course that I've been on, other than to be an inspector. Mm. Pretty dry. Dull. What, um, so if you've got young teachers who have, just starting out, what, what tips do you tend to give them about managing a classroom? And um, I, think, I think to take mm. control early on, to sit them where you want them mm. to sit, not where they choose to. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, we all know that pupils like good order, essentially, mm. where the, to know where the boundaries are. Um, so you used to write up your classroom rules on a... No. No. <laughs> no. So I wasn't a great... Yeah. I'm, I've never, ever I mean, been a great believer in a set of school rules. I would, I'm much happier with... Because I, I think what really matters, and this is very dragon, I'm sure, but uh, is obedience to the unenforceable. Yeah. You, know, you don't rush up to grab the last supermarket trolley from an old lady uh, because you... it's illegal, but because it's wrong. Yeah. And I think that I like the old dragon thing of, um, you know, be late for a lesson if it means that you've spotted a, a, someone fall off their bike in Dragon Lane and you go and help them. Yeah. Uh, so I've never, and, and uh, at times as a headmaster, Staff are terribly, of course, staff see things enviably clearly from time to time. <laughs> and headmasters have to be more nuanced and circumspect. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, oh, well, let's ban the latest craze. You know, it's a frightful nuisance. And everyone's <laughs> pinching. Everyone's pinching. But if you make it impossible for people to pinch anything, uh, then how do you re learn to resist temptation? Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was never a banner. Yeah. You've got a rather good line on justice versus mercy, I seem to yes. remember. I can't remember the details. <laughs> well, it's a question I tend to ask when interviewing hmm. the heads, um, you know, which, which quality is most at work during your, you know, most hmm. uppermost in your mind during your work, justice or mercy. And I suppose what I'm looking for is that you want someone to be... Um, merciful towards an individual instinct mm. I think is to be merciful um, but there comes a time when if you are merely concentrate on being merciful to an individual then um, you know, there comes a time when justice to the community mm. kicks in and I think particularly at prep school age goodness me if you can't make a mistake with the ages of 8 and 13 <laughs> and um, you know, I, I think that's, that's the sort of thing I'm looking for. Um, I was asked a very tricky question by um, John Edison, who was a rather sort of evangelical, well-known on the prep school circuit. He probably preached at some of things in your time. Uh, but he was a scripture, scripture union, um, you know, and, and told lovely stories, you know. And um, he asked me, would I... There he was, sitting with his, with his dog collar on. Um, if the best candidate for the head of maths, say, was uh, an atheist, would you appoint him? And I thought, oh, God. 
Um, quite a googly. Uh, quite a googly. <laughs> and I just remember, say, I think I got away with it, I just said, yes, I would if he were the best candidate for the job, I would appoint him on one condition, that he would do nothing to undermine the Christian ethos of the school. Mm. What's the most important thing for someone under 13 to know in English and history, do you think? You let's, take English, yeah. let's take English first, the most elusive subject. Um, I was very pleased at Pathwick to have two outstanding teachers of English, Nigel Ramage and Harry Packenham. They were such a contrast and they didn't get on at all, personally. <laughs> Nigel was a former actor, flamboyant, creative. The boys loved him. Uh, tremendous. And Harry, spelling, punctuation, <laughs> grammar. The sort of things that we learned through Latin. And, yeah. of course, Latin was still uh, an important subject of Papawick. Um, so I suppose what I was... So I decided that in the common entrance here, I think it would be very good... Uh, Nigel did the scholars, the two common entrance sets, they shared the teaching. So they had, the, I think, the best of both worlds. I, I, think, I think it's absolutely essential, whether it's through Latin or whether it's these days more likely through teaching English, that, that boys and girls learn to communicate, uh, to, to uh, write a sentence to mm. know what a sentence is. Um, it must contain a main verb. And I think there's real place for traditional uh, teaching in that respect. Did you used to do it by dictation? Or do you, do you remember the, the way you... I Yes, I did. I, 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 dictation, certainly. Um... I suppose the danger of those English lessons is that they, they can get terribly dry if they're, if they're yes, not taught. Yes, um, I, I think that, I mean, I much preferred, I mean, I loved uh, uh, teaching um, poetry, figures of speech. Mm. And, you know, I, I think, to be perfectly honest, in that sort of less prescriptive age, it was quite, you know, boys would write essays and... You know, from their own examples, one could say, no, this sentence would look much better. How would it look mm. much better? What would, should one say to make oneself absolutely clear and make it sound better? Mm. You don't necessarily have to go into the details of um, participles and subjunctives and uh, clauses and phrases. You know, I, yeah. don't, I don't think that is... But, but I think to know how to write good English um, is very important. So it had a, an aesthetic dimension Def as well. Definitely. I, and I, I, otherwise, as you say, it can be wholly dry and turn them off the subject. I mean, I think to encourage them to write expressively and, um, and poetry, of course, is a, is a very good means of that be, be, because you can break a few rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the areas I'm interested in is whether there are ways of teaching or content that you can teach that that helps the subject stay with someone as they grow older. Yes. So that the <clears throat> the literature they read when they're they're young or the, the history they've learnt yes. colours their their sort of almost daily mm. perception as they go through the world when they're older. Do you have any sense of whether you were successful at doing that? Um, well, not consciously, uh, probably. <laughs> I hope subco I hope it yeah. just happened. Yeah. Um, and, and they, you know, they seem to enjoy the lessons. I mean, I'm a bit rusty on this sort of thing. But, were there um, any books? A, a great that, believer yeah. in yeah. mnemonics, ways of remembering <laughs> yeah. things. I mean, I can still remember, I can recite the kings and queens of England. Uh, I, um, was that Willy Willy Harry Steve? Was yes, that right? Yes, yes. And then, you, then, I, then you just learn the... Hmm. All the I can give you all the dates, 1066, 1087, 1087, but we haven't got time. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, no plan like yours to study history wisely. That gives you all the, that gives you from the Normans uh, through to the Windsors and the Houses. But, but what know? does that do? Though? Well, I mean, 
Yeah. You can see why, well, I don't necessarily agree, but I, no. you can see why that has been criticised as, yes. as unnecessarily rote. Yes. Yes. What does that give to I think there is a room yeah. for rote if it means being able to contextualise. Yeah. Um, I think there's a place for it. I certainly think there's a place for learning poetry. Yeah. Uh, I can regard, I can still recite poems that I learned at prep school. Um, and they stayed with me ever more on occasion and even, you know, answer a crossword clue for me. <laughs> so I think, I do, and all, and all, you know, it's good training for the mind. Mm. I mean, so much of life is, is having to perform on the day. Mm. Um, and I, I did a, talking about classroom methods and so forth, I did a, for, for Neil McLaughlin a few years ago at uh, WCCS I did a, um, uh, an in-service training on visual um, auditory and kinesthetic learning now it's nothing I ever put into practice <laughs> when I taught but I thought well no this is, this is actually uh, I'm in danger of coming a little trendy here <laughs> I think it's rather important to discover how children learn mm. and I, I, I'm an auditory learner and I just put, used to put in the, you know, for my finals and other exams, I put the cassette in the car. Yeah. And I, I, and I just learned a whole lot of stuff. And I don't, oh, you can say, I'm sure that's unscholarly, uh, but at least it means that you know, where relevant, you can actually get something down which gives you confidence to see it through. Yeah, you know? yeah. Are, are there particular books, either in English or history, that you found worked really well with... Well, I have to young, say, young I children. did like those b b books by David Burt. Um, uh, 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 B-U-R-T. B-U-R-T. Oh, B-I-R-T. It'll come to me. B-U-R-T, I think. He was deputy head at Abbey Hall for many, many years. And he wrote these... These were evidence-based books. Right. Uh, the skills, skills. <laughs> um, and I must say, I did... They were very interesting. And, um, you know... There were lots of the, there was lots of interest there. Mm. Um, I mean, it's a bit like it's a bit like cricket captaincy, really. I think <laughs> most of the time, one should strip stick to strict orthodoxy on the grounds that strict orthodoxy comes from years mm. of playing the game, studying the game, making bowling changes that are conventional. You know, the ball's still hard and shiny, and you know, or when it's roughed up and reverse now and all that sort of thing and yet there are times when nothing's happening mm. um, for, for you know outrageously wacky fields and I think teaching's a bit like that yeah I think if it's too you, you use the word dry a lot and I think that's uh, will never be dry and and but take sides I remember at the history department of the dragon school had Edward Hudson next to me a good friend of mine who became headmaster of West Hill and I, I was up at 2A and he was up at 2B. We taught the Civil War and we taught it from different perspectives. Uh, I right. was a, a parliamentarian and he was a royalist. And, and you know, and, and the boys loved it. And they, you and know. Based in Oxford, presumably you could go out and see some of the battlefields Abs that were nearby. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just take them to the Rose and Crown in North Parade. And then, I mean, <laughs> and point out that um, Dickie North Duke Parade he... <laughs> is actually... Um, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 south of South Parade. Yeah. And that all dates back to the Civil War. Yeah. So, yeah, we... So you were a fan of experiential learning as well back in the day? Well, I suppose we didn't know it as such. But yes, and oh gosh, we used to take them to I remember to Marston Moor, Naseby, Warwick Castle. Um, uh, you know, and I think there's got to be structure to that and, yeah. and you, because otherwise it's a complete waste of time. I, I saw on your website, Red, that... Oh. Um, <laughs> When you were, <clears throat> you know, listing your achievements, you you had ISI, an ISI quote as <laughs> one of the um, uh, as a signal achievement, or, or as a, a signal to parents or schools choosing you of your uh, experience and credibility. But I, I'm interested when it comes to teaching, what the sort of the the, the proudest successes are because they're they're hard often to see and often they mm -hmm. bear fruit it, it would seem years or decades later yeah. particularly in, in the pupils so 
but when you think about um, uh, success, <laughs> mm. what, what, you know, what, what does it look like or feel like? Well, it, it feels very different now from at the time. I mean, I have to be absolutely honest at the time at Papawick, what were our greatest successes? Um, Eaton scholarships mm. at the time, um, beating Caldercott at rugby, <laughs> shame to say, <laughs> doesn't happen anymore. Um, uh, building the sports hall mm. in the music school, raising over a million in the mid 90s. Mm. Um, those sort of tangible successes, uh, great pride in appointing good staff and seeing them seeing them go on to run their own schools. Yeah, I'm terribly yeah. proud of John Bartlett, headmaster of St Andrews Bangwall, Tom Bunbury, headmaster of Papawick, uh, Martin Barker, headmaster of uh, Westbourne House. I could go on, there's yeah. seven of them I think yeah. now. And uh, I think that gives one tremendous satisfaction and also optimism. Yeah. As George Littleton used to say, the one essential quality of a schoolmaster, <laughs> optimism. That, that that things that they not necessarily learned under me, but the sort of things we were trying to do then, mm. they'll be trying to do now. Yeah. And um, I, th I would say that stays with me today. The Eton scholarships, the, you know, that ghastly habit that headmasters and headmistresses have of getting up on speech day and boasting about 100% common entrance rate. <laughs> well, if they've done their job properly, they surely well should. Um, I think... The pleasure I get now is seeing old boys and old girls um, and the clear that they were happy mm. at school and have fond memories of it. Mm. And that, that is probably the, the, the thing that means something to me now. Um, and all those, you know, beating Caldecott at rugby really <laughs> <laughs> does. I think we took these things much too seriously. <laughs> Um, but but that's easier said from a distance. Yeah. yeah. So when you sort of survey the educational landscape today, well, you said you're very optimistic. In some respects, looking at at your own pre uh, successes, but um, are there things you're particularly fearful of? Um, and I'm fearful of. Um, something I've been warning about for a long, long time. Uh, since the early 90s of, of creeping nationalisation. I think independent schools are uh, very important because they establish, you know, I mean, the whole, the great success of what may be called private schooling is that we have ditched the, the term private schooling, even public schools mm. with its rather emotive <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, uh, connotations, to, to independent schools. And independence is seen to establish a principle, independent from government, independent so that we can use tried and trusted methods that have stood the, the, the test of time, as well as innovate. You know, I remember that great thing Jeremy Nichols said to me when he was headmaster of Stowe, that we're all searching, you know, headmasters of Stowe, you know, good, what might be called very good schools without mm. being great schools. We're all searching for that something that's going to make our schools great make our schools distinctive, different. I, I'm a great believer in all that. Mm. And um, we come up with it, you know, this great sort of, yes, eureka moment. It could be curricular, co-curricular. Yeah. And then you discover that Eton have been doing it quietly <laughs> for 20 years. Uh, and um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I'm essentially, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. I do worry about schools all becoming rather similar. Yeah. Uh, I, th I thank goodness there are still single sex schools um, as well as co-ed ones that if the in, if the independent sector doesn't stand for freedom of choice I'm not sure quite what it does stand for um, above all there are people out there you know I think it's fashionable to say there aren't good people around to run these schools anymore I, I see plenty of them mm. um, last night at St Philip's young Alex mm. you know he looks who should Very be courteous. you know <laughs> head boy at um, Stonyhurst still uh, but but my goodness uh, how impressive mm. how impressive mm. um, so Lots of and, and you know and to my mind reassuringly old school mm. 
Oh, what a good note to end on, Red. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, nice and um, All right. I hope. Uh, I wish you luck with uh, all, all your other subjects. Thanks very much. <laughs>